I'm Jane Radical. I'm a game designer. Uh, I've been making games online now for 10 years, and uh, my goal for the next decade is to try to make it as easy to save the world in real life as it is to save the world in online games. Now, I have a plan for this, and it entails convincing more people, including all of you, to spend more time playing bigger and better games. Right now, we spend three billion hours a week playing online games. Some of you might be thinking, that's a lot of time to spend playing games, maybe too much time, considering how many urgent problems we have to solve in the real world. Um, but actually, according to my research at the Institute for the Future, uh, it's actually the opposite is true. Three billion hours a week is not nearly enough gameplay to solve the world's most urgent problems. Um, in fact, I believe that if we want to survive the next century on this planet, we need to increase that total dramatically. I've calculated the total we need at 21 billion hours of gameplay every week. So that's probably a bit of a counterintuitive idea, so I'll just I'll say it again, let it sink in. If we want to solve problems like hunger, poverty, climate change, global conflict, obesity, I believe that we need to aspire to play games online for at least 21 billion hours a week by the end of the next decade. No, I'm serious. I am. Here's why. This picture pretty much sums up why I think games are so essential to the future survival of the human species. We're talking with Eric Gordon today, the director of the Engagement Game Lab at Emerson College. And his track for DML 2014 is entitled Playing for Keeps, Gameful Design for Real World Action and Social Change. So um, please tell us what's exciting to you about your, your track and uh, what you look, look forward to, to doing. I'm really excited to <clears throat> run this track at at, uh, at DML, largely because to bring together the the, the typical uh, attendees at DML are, that are, are teachers and educators and and thinkers in the space of digital media and learning um, around specifically the issue of of games and game gameful design in an out of classroom setting. So what I'm really interested in is how games and play are creating a context for interaction um, within a civic space um, where that can be that can be really powerful and that could actually change the way that that communities interact and change the way that governments respond to communities one of the tensions that is present in in um, in this idea um, is the tension of play and the and what is typically associated with the work of civic life and civic engagement and political action. And what is what I what I really hope to explore in this track is where that tension, um, those places where that tension comes to life, where the where the, the the political action itself that's mediated through a game is is playful and even fun and 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 pleasurable. But that where that that institutions in some way or another have to be responsive. Um, to that act of play. And so in, and when we think about games, we often think about play being, being outside of everyday life and this, this idea of this magic circle being this sort of protected space where the implications of play are, are, are um, contained within the, within, within the game environment itself. But I think what we're seeing in the way that, that games are being designed and played in, in situations that are um, beyond, say, a, a, a single screen or a, or, a, or a board, that we're actually seeing the, the implications of those play acts extending um, to, uh, you know, to, uh, as I said before, to communities and institutions beyond that. So I really want people to come together um, that can explore those tensions, explore the places for play um, in, uh, in uh, political life. Um, and and to push this beyond where where it's been, so beyond the the game in the classroom, uh, beyond the gamification of of political life, but really towards that that um, that moment of transforming um, the, the those those everyday actions of political life and civic life into playful actions that I think can be far more powerful and far more effective um, than the way that we typically think about them especially for those three people who are online watching this on, on web stream. 
Um, welcome to playing for keeps, gameful design for real world action and social change. Uh, my name is Gene Koo. I am an independent consultant who works with organizations on using video games for advancing their social mission. Um, my name is Scott Osterwal. I'm the creative director of the MIT Education Arcade and of our not-for-profit spin-off, the Learning Games Network. Um, I've made a lot of games over about 20 years. And I'm also a fellow at the Berkman Center for Internet and Society at Harvard, where I, I study games uh, for um, uh, games that, that facilitate, motivate, create uh, civic uh, engagements. When, when we design a game that, that is supposed to achieve a purpose outside of that, then we have a, a bit of a conflict between what Suits calls the pre-losery goal and what I'll call for a second the extra-losery goal. What is that goal outside of the game? So there is the goal of the player when the player, either before the player enters into the game or while the player is in the game, and then there are these other goals, these learning goals, these civic goals, these action-taking goals um, that we want to achieve. And I see that as a really interesting kind of tension space. So thank you for having me here. Um, my name is Karina Wong, and I work at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. It's always a privilege for me to come to DML. I feel like I'm an interloper into the MacArthur world. I only get invited every other year, I noticed. Um, but I always um, really meet really interesting people and um, love being here and um, um, working with Connie and, um, and all of her team. So here lies the challenge, uh, designing games for social impact, for finding the points of convergence between the losery and the extra losery. So the game is social impact only when the player makes a conscious or unconscious connection between the two without sacrificing the integrity of the game. So what is that moment when the player understands like, aha, I'm playing this game, even though I was playing it to play the game, I'm playing this game and I learned about poverty. I learned about something else. I'm even, I'm even better equipped to take some sort of action in, a, in the world. Hi. Greetings. Uh, so I, I want to talk to you guys today as a teacher, which I am, a child advocate, which I am, and the dad of four kids, which I really am, and I've been driving around to soccer games and carpools all day, so I think that is the theme of what I'd like to talk to you about a little today. And actually, since the theme is reinventing capitalism, I thought I'd talk to you about the core essence of reinventing capitalism the fundamental reality of the American dream as we know it, which in my book, and I hope in all of your books, is children and the next generation of our society. And today, that next generation, that reality is sorely at risk in a way that's almost unprecedented in most of our lifetimes. For the past 30 years, really 30 years, we have systematically underinvested in the young people in this country, children and teens. They are the true engine of our economic future. They are those who will truly reinvent capitalism. And young people and kids have gotten the short end of the stick time after time after time for the last 30 plus years. As a result, I would argue that our society, our future, all of our future in this room, but most of all theirs, is sorely at risk. And if we don't change that story and change that picture, then all of us are gonna pay a very, very heavy price. Well, I don't know if you think there's any common sense in media, but we're about to find out from someone who uh, is trying to make it that way. Uh, Jim Steyer is with us again. He's CEO and founder of Common Sense Media. Nice to see you again, Jim. Good to be here, Jack. You seem in a good mood. Are you happy about what's going on in the media and what Common Sense is doing? Well, I am very happy about what Common Sense Media is doing. And, and overall, in the world of media and technology, it's a 24-7 media and tech world for our kids today. Yeah. And that's what we do at Common Sense. We actually make it easier for parents and for kids and for teachers to make good choices about media and technology in their okay, lives. Now hey, everyone. Welcome to the Make Learning Relevant podcast series produced by the Connected Learning Alliance. My name is Jeff Brazil, and I am with the Alliance. Today, we are really fortunate to have with us Karina Wong. Karina serves as the Deputy Director of Education at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. 
She leads the College Ready Work portfolio, which is focused on creating the conditions for student success by investing in teachers and improving the work they do. Her investments include efforts to help teachers implement the Common Core in their classrooms, opportunities for teachers to form networks and collaborate virtually in more innovative and intelligent ways to deliver professional development. Thanks for taking the time to be with us. And how could we redesign them and create them more into more effective learning organizations? I think paying attention to both that personalized learning on both the student and teacher side and the collective development on both the student and teacher side because we're, we're, we're all trying to learn. Nobody's alone in this. And if we really want to scale it, it can't be individual by individual or student by student. So another issue that gets a lot of airtime that is closely related to the need for change in education is the, is the shift in the economy. There are fewer and fewer jobs for individuals with only a high school education and jobs are decreasing for those even with a college education as the economy shifts. Thinking about this and and the way we think about learning in general, how does our education system, not just the schools, need to change in order to deal with these new challenges that are happening in the workplace and in career development? Yeah, I I think we have to get out of what some teachers call the six-period day, (laughs) that we're not going to be able to educate our kids for this new economy in a six-period day and in the four walls of the school, that um, we have to really think very differently about what schooling looks like and where education comes from, um, not just from teachers or parents, but from other kinds of mentors and, and, and where that learning takes place. Yes, that sort of touches on the issue of assessment and outcomes. How do we go about making changes in that area? Yeah, you know, we made I made a, several investments in um, game-based investments, what I'll call, to think about how to use games for learning and for assessment. And I really believe in the power of um, those kinds of innovations and the question is how do we begin to think about them or adopt them in schools and how do we begin to recognize or validate what kids actually learn in different ways and I think that is a really tough question because I think our current assessment evaluation accountability systems are not set up for sort of that v3 way of thinking um, about proficiency. Three can you say more about that? Uh, oh, I say more about V3. So I'm just thinking, you know, we've gone through so many phases about um, accountability reform and standard space reform and all these kinds of things. And I think we're really needing to think a little further out. Um, when I say V3, I'm sort of thinking, you know, imagine a world where you're not um, trapped inside. I've got to take a standardized test in the spring to know whether or not my kid is ready for college. How do we think very differently about that? Or to know whether or not the schools are doing well. What can we do faster, more iteratively, and what's more relevant to kids? Former California legislator and champion of Filipino causes, Leland Yee, pleaded guilty this morning to a felony racketeering charge in an organized crime and corruption case. Romel Comtara now joins us via phone. San Francisco, where that's where he is, to tell us all about it. Romel? Jell, the popular California politician known for advocating for the rights of Filipino World War II veterans during his term may be headed to jail. Lilan Yi, who pleaded guilty before a federal court this morning to a felony racketeering charge, may face up to a possible 20 years in prison and a $250,000 fine when he is sentenced on October 21st. Yi previously pleaded not guilty to bribery, money laundering, and other felony charges, but he changed his plea. He was arrested in March of 2014 and initially was charged with accepting $62,000 in bribes from undercover FBI agents. An FBI affidavit shows that he was trying to help an undercover agent get high-powered weapons worth $500,000 to $2.5 million from a Muslim separatist group in the Philippines. Jell? You know, Rommel, a lot of our Kababayans are still shocked up to now. Now, following his change of plea in court, did former Senator Leland Yee face the media? And what was his demeanor? Well, Joe, first of all, according to reporters live tweeting inside, prior to his plea, Senator Yee had to sit with the media because there wasn't enough seats in the courthouse. And they also tweeted that Yee was smiling and chatting with them. Now, upon leaving the courthouse, Senator Yee, who was dressed in a dark suit and red tie, did not speak with us, but he had what appeared to be a calm demeanor and a smile on his face before leaving in his vehicle. Joe? Maraming salamat sa iyo. Romel Conclara reporting from San Francisco.